All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 again. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12. Let's pick up where we ended last time, starting at verse 14. <laughs> Hebrews 12, verse 14. Get all your sniffles and coughs out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> There's always someone. <laughs> it's picking on me. And sneezes. Hebrews 12, 14. But before we do, uh, notice the language of verse 11 once again. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. That has to be one of the most elegant, sublime texts in all the Bible. It's beautiful in its vocabulary. It's majestic, noble. And the meaning of that verse is the benefit of a good spanking. <laughs> You don't take that away right away when you're reading that text. The King James Bible is so far above the uncouth and the crude way of speaking and communicating found in modern translations. The NIV. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Contemporary English version. It is never fun to be corrected. In fact, at the time, it's always painful. Living Bible. Being punished isn't enjoyable when it's, when it's happening. Any believer who doesn't appreciate the beauty of the authorized text is brain dead. We lay that alongside the crass, rough, coarse language of modern translations, they don't measure up. I'm reminded of the JW Bible. The shortest verse in the Bible, John 11:35, says two words, Jesus wept. The word wept, W-E-P-T, or the word to weep or weeping, that word isn't used very often. It's used in graceful speech, proper English. The JW Bible says, Jesus gave way to tears. Yuck. It's not beautiful at all. <clears throat> but let's go back to verse 14, our text, chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, we're on dangerous ground with this verse. So we have to proceed with great caution today. Go, if you will, to Revelation chapter 1 for a moment. Look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1, notice there verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Chapter 6, Revelation 6, and verse 16. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. So, and now I was going to say for a couple of the verses for good measure, those verses say that every eye is going to see him, with or without holiness. So let me move on. Uh, every eye shall see him, with or without holiness. Another verse that uh, poses the same dilemma 
Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And yet, according to Revelation 1, verse 7, everyone will see him whether their hearts are pure or not pure. So you can't just plow through a verse and assume that a quick uh, uh, perusing of it, a quick reading of it, will uh, yield all the understanding that you ought to have or need to have. <clears throat> modern versions and the modern uh, scholarship behind the modern versions want to think that it's necessary to turn to, to turn to the Greek or to Greek vocabularies or to Greek lexicons in order to understand an English Bible. And they end up spiritualizing most of the Bible anyway when they get done with it. Now the problem with saying that a verse is simply spirit, spiritualized uh, or should be taken in some figurative way, you can't take it literally. When you say that a verse or a text in the Bible can't be taken literally, and it can't be believed literally, there's got to be some sort of figurative meaning to it, and this is done all the time. When you make something allegorical, or say it's figurative, or it's to be spiritualized, then anyone's interpretation is just as good as anybody else's interpretation. But when you say this is going to be taken literally, whether I fully understand it or not, then you fix the meaning, you fix its definition, and there's not a lot of wiggle room then to say, well, it means this or it means that. You know, you say tomato, I say tomato. Tomato, tomato, potato, potato. Let's call the whole thing off. That's to be, that seems to be the approach of a lot of Christians this, these days. Um, here's another ch challenge. Beloved, Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. He that doeth evil hath not seen God. 3 John, verse 11. There's a lot more to, to take notice of and weigh alongside other texts before simply summarizing uh, this text as simply God wants to be holy, period. There's a lot more to be considered. Verse 14 in our text says, Holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Blessed are they, excuse me, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5, verse 8. Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time. Hebrews 9, verse 28. He that doeth evil hath not seen God. 3 John, verse 11. Last of all, he was seen of me as a born, born out of due time. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come, and call, he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth beneath, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Psalm 50, verses 2 to 5. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us Psalm 67 verse 1 the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light upon them hath the light shined Isaiah 9 verse 2 thou that dwellest between the cherubims shine forth Psalm 80, verse 1 says. Those references all taken together have to do with a mid-tribulation, or what we might call a post-tribulation, just before the end of the tribulation, appearance of the Lord to the Jewish remnant left behind, those that have not uh, succumbed to the pressure of the man of sin, and they have not taken the mark of the beast. Psalm 80, verse 7. Turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be turned. We shall, excuse me, we shall be saved. There I make a mistake here. Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. The Lord came 
from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto, the, unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. Hebrews 12, verse 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh for, it, for, excuse me, for if they escape not, who refused him that speaketh on earth, such as Moses, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. That's where the Lord Jesus was speaking from when he spoke to the Apostle Paul. Go back to Acts chapter 9 for a moment. Acts chapter 9. <clears throat> Acts 9 and verses 5 and 6. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said unto him, and the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? The Lord said unto him, Rise and go into the city, and shall be told thee what thou must do. The Lord was speaking to the Apostle Paul from heaven, according to the Bible. Um, so it's not unimaginable that the Lord would call to his saints from heaven in the middle of a tribulation or in the end of the tribulation. Do I fully understand all of that? No, I sure don't. And yet there's enough scripture to conclude that there's going to be some appearance of Jesus Christ at the end or near the end of the tribulation, probably corresponding, probably coinciding with the catching up of the two witnesses, the book of Revelation chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 15 says, looking diligently, lest any man uh, faint of the grace of God, lest any bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now, here we're forced into a tribulation passage, in a tribulation context, I should say, uh, and it can go one of two ways. Either this is a saved man uh, who fails to get enough grace to endure to the end, to stay holy. Um, <clears throat> Hebrews 4, verse 16 says, let us, therefore, come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, and therefore to follow after peace, according to verse 14. Or else, the reference is to an, a saved man, a uh, saved uh, who failed to appropriate salvation by grace through faith to start with. Doctrinally, the text will have to be to the tribulation saints after the rapture who's uh, in danger of losing it. Some tribulation saint who's in danger of losing it if he doesn't hold out to the end. Look back at Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3, verse 6, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. And chapter 3, verse 14, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, that's verse 13, I'm sorry. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence, steadfast unto the end. And Hebrews 6, and the first six verses there. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of, res uh, and of resurrection, of the dead, 
and the element, excuse me, and the eternal judgment. And this will we do, if God permit. For it is not, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good uh, word of God and the power of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified in themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. And then in our text here, the root of bitterness that you and I are, to, are warned against was a warning uh, to the Jew under the Old Testament not to turn from the Lord, but back, if you will, at Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy 29, verse 18. Thus there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away from, excuse me, who turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. Thus there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. So, the root of bitterness is that someone would turn from the Lord God uh, in the time of tribulation, the time of trouble. Verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, such an example, uh, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, Esau's birthright had to do with inheriting a piece of land, a prop land, uh, the land of promise, as it's said to be. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, verses uh, 8 and 9. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So Esau's birthright had to do with a promise of land, an inheritance of land. Verse 16 in our text is, As Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Think how much damage has been done by one person deciding to sin, thinking they could get away with it and wouldn't uh, matter, the big picture, or so they thought. One person's sin can have a ripple effect and damage the lives, damage the hopes, damage the confidence of Christians all over the place. I mean, one discarded match can burn down 50,000 acres in a forest, right? And uh, one person's sin, they think they're not hurting anybody. They think they're getting away with it. They think they can do it with uh, impunity and it won't catch up to them. The Bible says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil, Ecclesiastes 8. Verse 11, because someone gets away with their sin now, they think no one's noticed and there hasn't been any consequence. They think they're going to get away with it forever. They think they can keep doing it, they can keep engaging in it, and it won't come back to haunt them. You know something? Some man can go out with a young woman. He thinks she's cute, he thinks she's pretty. And that's why he wants to see her. He wants to be seen with her. And, uh, but he doesn't witness to her. He makes no effort to lead her to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe she's, you know, attracted to him physically. He's attracted to her physically. And they never go beyond that. And uh, next thing you know, and he's got some sort of latent conscience in the back of his mind that he should be a Christian. He should try to witness to her. 
he's trying to lead her to the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's too preoccupied with the fact that she's pretty, and she's prettier than all of his friends' girlfriends, and she's prettier than his friends' wives, and uh, she, she's prettier than, than everyone else, and he's, so he's happy about that. Well, once you go too far, you can't witness to her. You get caught up, go too far with somebody, uh, you can't then put the brakes on, so I'm going to back up, and now I'm going to witness to her. You, you've already gone too far. Why should that, why should that young lady want to get saved now? Why should, why should some unsaved person want to be um, saved? You think some unsaved person is going to say, you know something, I feel guilty for going too far and fornicating. Uh, let's put the brakes on it. I want to get saved. No, that doesn't happen. I want to get saved. It doesn't happen. And people go too far and they think that uh, there'll be no consequence. They think it won't catch up with them. And uh, they don't want their friends to know that they've been fooling around and gone too far with them. And so they try to pretend like they haven't been too involved with them. Uh, I want to witness to her. I want to witness to him. And the truth is, you've done everything except witness. You might as well get married already. You're already setting up house and hoping nobody knows about it, nobody finds out about it. And there's just enough pang, there's just, there's just enough conscience inside of you that tells you you've been doing wrong as a Christian. But the flesh is strong. You don't want to quit sinning. You don't want to give up your sin. You don't want to do what you should have done to start with and say, if you're not interested in the Lord, then, then there's no future for us. If, there's no, if you're not interested in the Word of God, then you and I have very little in common. That's how a true believer should look at it. Say, well, I don't want to die an old maid. I don't want to die in lonely without a, a woman by my side. I realize that. It can be very difficult. My dad could tell us stories of how many Christian women were told by their future husbands that uh, they would go to church once they got married. They never did. They're going to get saved, but they never did. We had a lady in our church when I was a teenager. I think she had three children, and I don't think I ever saw her husband at church. Met him once or twice, decent guy, good businessman, but he gave her the song and dance that, you know, I'm going to go to church, and she was trying to be spiritual. She tried to raise her kids in Sunday school, and as far as I could tell, she did a, a pretty good job at it, but she was lonely. He wasn't interested in the Lord. He was interested in a woman. And that goes on all the time. That happens all the time. And it's very sad to see some Christian man or some Christian woman be so stupid to pursue that relationship, thinking it'll be different in our case. It never is. And... Um, For one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Adam, uh, not our Adam here, but, but uh, <laughs> you know how much damage to the human race, planet Earth, came about from one man's disobedience in the garden? One man's sin, the entire race of man fell because of one man's sin. And it took a Savior, it took a Redeemer to come and to sacrifice himself for the sake of sinners, to put things right once again. And even then, most men aren't interested in it. But the opportunity is there. The redemption was made possible. But when, when one person sets their mind on sin, and the Bible tells us in the case of Moses, it, uh, sin is pleasurable for a season. You know, if sin was painful and tortuous, tortuous, and uh, it caused nothing but grief and pain. Nobody would be engaging in it, right? But sin is fun. Sin satisfies the flesh. Sin makes you think that uh, you're invincible. You got away with it. And uh, you're happy. You're enjoying it. And if you were to say, I'm going to put the brakes on it, you'd have to admit that you've been in the wrong. And no Christian wants to admit that they've been in the wrong. They don't want to admit 
you know, I've been wrong, I've been fornicating, I've been sinning, I've been getting drunk, I've been doing any number of things that would be unbecoming of a believer. They don't want to admit that because it makes them look bad. It wounds their pride. So they try to get around it, they try to rationalize it, they try to say, well, at least I'm not as bad as some Christians. Don't, stop doing that. Stop saying, well, I'm not as bad as other Christians have been. I haven't done what they've done. Yeah, but you're not as good as other Christians are either. We always want to compare ourselves to someone who's worse than we are, or who has done more uh, wickedness or committed more uh, evil as Christians, and we never want to compare ourselves with someone who's been living a virtuous and a chaste and a clean uh, moral life as a Christian. Yeah, maybe they're lonely, maybe they wish they had a, a, a wife by their side, maybe they wish they had a husband by their side, maybe God will bring that one, maybe God won't bring it. But I talked a couple weeks about deferred gratification. That's the problem with the flesh, the flesh wants it now. And uh, d d d uh, damn everything else, I want it now. And I don't want anyone telling me I can't. I don't want anyone telling me it's wrong. I don't want anyone judging me. I'm not judging you. I'm simply pointing out you're a sinner. I'm simply pointing out that you're a hypocrite. I'm simply pointing out that if you're going to be completely honest, then it's going to cause you some shame and embarrassment. And you don't want that. But think how much damage has been caused to the human race because some people won't give up their sin for the sake of righteousness for the sake of pleasing God. Or we worry about what other people think. We worry about what uh, our reputation at work might be. We worry about uh, you know, how we're going to look uh, when we're posting our, our stuff on Facebook or somebody reads about us online. Um, why don't you care what God thinks? You know one thing that's true uh, is that when you're engaging in sin, you're not reading your Bible. This much I know. You're trying to engage in sin and get away with sin and think no harm has been done and I, I'm in control, I can handle it, and you're not reading your Bible. You might say, I did read it. Yeah, but you didn't read it with a desire to actually know and have God speak to you. You did it out of some sort of rote uh, practice, some repetition to say, well, I'm a Bible believer, I'm a Bible reader. You might be a saved Christian. You might believe the Word of God to be uh, the Bible to be the Word of God. But as I said earlier, uh, there's a difference between being saved and being a Christian. Being a Christian is hard. Getting saved is easy. It's the easiest proposition in the universe to be saved. Yeah. One of the easiest things you'll ever do is to trust Jesus Christ as the forgiver of your sins, whose blood washed away, can wash away your sins by a simple act of faith. You're trusting in nothing else but the power of Jesus Christ and His grace to save you. Becoming a Christian is a very difficult thing. It's a different proposition entirely. I don't mean uh, using the word Christian like every unsafe cult uses it. They all think they're Christians. But I mean someone who, first of all, is a believer. Secondly, they are given over to living for Him no matter what. Would to God that every believer took it seriously and said, I want to be a Christian. I don't want to just say that I'm saved. I want to be a true Christian, and my life completely given over to living for Jesus Christ and whatever He wants, whatever He desires of me, that's what I'm willing to do. There was an old gospel song, whatever it takes to be more like you, that's what I'll be willing to do. Great lyrics, it's great melodies, blessing to listen to, but when you listen to the words of that song, and you realize sin destroys everything. Preach a sermon a couple weeks back about the moth-eaten garment, the picture of sin. It can destroy everything. A little bit can ruin. Listen, um, I only have a piece of white paper to illustrate this with. Now, okay, I'll do it this way. You need a piece of note paper and to write something important. And you pick up a piece of paper, but it's got a little mark on it like that. 
Do you want to use it or do you want to find one that has no mark on it? Normally, people will find one that has no mark on it because this, they say, this is ruined. It doesn't look good. Yeah, but the rest of it's clean. It's clean over here. Ignore that one little piece, but most people don't look at it that way. And Christians don't look at their lives that way. They don't look at the one little sin. Didn't the Lord Jesus say a little leaven, leaven up the whole lump? He certainly did. And so... Now, let's move on. Verse... Um, Too many people, saved people, I should say, they sacrifice the eternal on the altar of the immediate. I want it now. I don't care what anyone says. I don't care what, how anyone objects to it. I don't care what other Christians with a better conscience than I have say about it. I'm going to do what I want to. You know, people, uh, my dad, i uh, mention him again. He said something to me years ago, and uh, the more I've thought about it, it stuck with me. People do what they want to do. They will justify anything. They will rationalize anything. And it doesn't matter the consequences. One little sin can ruin a family. One little sin can um, bring on greater sin, ruin a society. One little sin can ruin the upbringing of children. One little sin. So it's like the sign of the forest fire, a guy tossing the match out the window, and the slogan said, one careless moment. So it is. One sin by Adam and his wife brought on the uh, destruction of the entire human race. The problem is Christians want to apologize. They want to say, I'm sorry for hurting you. Why don't you apologize for hurting God? He's the last person they care about. They say, well, God's a big boy. He can handle it. Well, treat God that way. I'm telling you, you're setting yourself up for judgment. You're setting yourself up for chastisement. You deal with God that way. There's a difference between being saved, that's your standing, and being a Christian, that's your state, your state of affairs. Too many people know they've been saved, they've been born again. They can tell you when, where, how, under which circumstances, but they're not Christians. They're not Christians. And uh, I hate to say it that way, but that is standing out to the truth. Verse 17 of our text. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, speaking of Esau, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Well, that's going to match... Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, the first six verses there, uh, about not renewing them again to repentance. Another great thing you might learn uh, when dealing with the charismatics, look back at chapter 6 again, and um, verse 4, where it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, and remain partakers of the heavenly Holy Ghost, and have been, and have tasted, excuse me, the good word of God, and the power of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified the, to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Uh, whenever you deal with a charismatic or a Pentecostal, take them to this text, and say to them, uh, according to this text, if you lose your salvation, it's impossible to get it back again. They've never read that because they're morons. They, they don't know that because they're not reading their Bible. They don't know anything about writing, dividing the Word of God. They don't realize that not every promise in the book is yours, not every chapter, every verse, every line, not everything written in the Word of God applies to you as a New Testament believer. It makes for a nice uh, feel-good uh, praise course, but it's not doctrinally true. Not everything written in the Bible is intended for you. Uh, when the Bible says, um, 
not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And when Ephesians 2, 6 tells us that God has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, then you can't come along with Hebrews chapter 6 and say, well, some people can lose their salvation when other verses indicate you can't lose it. It's already a done deal. So we have to learn how to rightly divide the word of truth and understand not everything in the Bible is intended for you to follow absolutely, perfectly uh, down the line. But um, after the rapture, it'll be too late, devotionally speaking, to suffer for Christ's sake, to try and witness, try to read your Bible more, to endure to the end, to endure a little embarrassment, endure a little uh, shame, if that be the case. And a believer, as a believer, uh, it's been said only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's great admonition for a believer in this age. There is no such thing as a second chance. You're not going to go through the karmic cycle of birth and rebirth and reincarnation. You know, to be reincarnated, that's not what the Bible means when it says you must be born again. That's good. That's, you know, that's the way some people interpret it who don't know the Bible and they want to believe in Eastern godly goog anyway. But in the tribulation, if someone does not hold out to the end, if they have not obtained enough grace to endure and uh, be strong until the end of the tribulation, they're in danger of losing it. Look forward, if you will, before we conclude this, to Revelation chapter uh, 12. Revelation 12. Revelation 12, verse 17. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Chapter 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Or excuse me, and the faith of Jesus. And chapter 20. Revelation 20. And verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. <laughs> Once we had done that, or had not done that. In the tribulation... Salvation will not be a matter of by grace through faith. Oh, this is how every Calvary Chapel preacher uh, presents it, because they don't know anything about the Bible. They think it's by grace through faith no matter what. All but that salvation has always been by grace through faith. It was by grace through faith in uh, Noah's day. It was by grace through faith when Adam uh, fell in the garden. It was by grace through faith when the Jews came out of Egypt. It was by grace through faith all over the scripture. That's not true. If it was by grace through faith, then why did God demand a, uh, an ark to be built for Noah, in Noah's case? It was simply, simply a matter of grace through faith, and works were not involved, then why did Noah build the ark? It was a matter of grace through faith. Why did God command animals to be sacrificed and offered in the book of Exodus and through the law? It's not been the same way all the time. And it won't be the same way after the catching up of the saints. After the rapture of the saints, salvation will then be a matter of <coughs> grace and works. Some element of grace and works <coughs> coupled together. We don't believe we're going to be here, so how much grace, how much works... We can't say. I don't plan. I don't intend to be here. 
But I can say this much. There's at least three verses right there, Revelation 12, 14, and 20, that would indicate salvation uh, requires some act of work or obedience to maintain your right standing with God, your salvation. And I'm glad I'm saved now. You know, I'm not waiting to pass some future test. I'm, wait I'm saved right now. I'm not waiting to avoid the Antichrist. I'm not waiting to see if I endure to the end. We read about it, and we try to uh, understand how it's going to apply to someone after the catching up of the saints. But it doesn't apply to me. I'm saved right now. Amen. That'd be a big amen on the end of that. I'm saved now. Amen. Um, amen. And uh, that's the greatest blessing in the world. The greatest blessing in the world to know that I went from sinner to saint that fast on November 5th, 1967. Almost 52 years ago. And this is a marvelous thing. It's just as vivid in my mind as it happened two weeks ago. It hasn't faded out of my memory. Hope that it never does. And trust the Lord that it won't. You want to have memories like that to know for sure. If you don't remember anything else, you know that you've been born again and you've been regenerated by the Holy Ghost. And if you were to die right now, you'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ. And with the Holy Ghost's help and the instruction of the Word of God, you want to be as faithful to live for Jesus Christ as you possibly can. One of these days, we're going to hear the words, Come up hither. Amen. When that moment comes, there won't be any more time to witness for Jesus Christ. There won't be any more time to live a virtuous life for Jesus Christ. Those chances will be gone. As I said a moment ago, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And someone else wrote, uh, life is short. Death is sure. Sin the curse. But Christ, the cure. Let's bring this to a close for today.